Hello and welcome back to our series on Bach's Orgelbüchlein. Today we're going to do something a little bit different. I've been asked to talk about learning to learn one of the pieces. So not so much about the piece itself, so much as about the process of learning it from scratch. And for this purpose we're going to look today at Vater Unser, uh, which is one of the miscellaneous choral preludes. Of course, one of the things we need before we start is an edition to play it from. We've talked a little bit in the introductory video about editions. Many editions work absolutely fine. And I suggested again in the introductory video that you steer clear of editions where an editor has gone through and put in fingering and expression marks and phrasing marks, which often don't represent either the way that you might want to play it or the way that we now understand Bach as having played. The fingering will often try to force you into a 19th century romantic interpretation of the music, which isn't necessarily particularly helpful. For the purposes of these films, where I've put up musical examples, I've used the Bach Gesellschaft edition, a 19th century complete works. This was a great piece of scholarship for its time and has a lot of good qualities. It's perhaps not the edition we would choose nowadays as a performing edition, but I'm using it uh, not as a form of recommendation, but because uh, it's copyright free. There's any amount obviously to say about articulation and fingering, performance issues in general, and I'm not going to talk about those today because we talk about them so much in the other films. I will only mention that in this particular piece, as in many of the others, all the semiquavers and the pedals can be played with alternate toes very readily, whereas the quavers in the pedals can't always be played easily with alternate toes without very complicated foot crossings, um, and perhaps not even then, which suggests to me, as I've said elsewhere, that Bach is anticipating that the semiquavers will be quite attached to each other, will, be, will flow, whereas the quavers themselves might be seen almost in terms of separate bows on a cello as almost legato but not quite, just gently detached. The one general comment that I will make is to listen to Bach recordings. Not recordings of organ music, but recordings of Bach in general. Find some nice orchestral music, choral music, whatever, uh, chamber music, and listen to how the notes work. Listen to how people play on different instruments, to how the phrasing works, how the harmonies work with each other. Get an idea of the ebb and flow in Bach, and that will transfer to the organ and improve your playing no end. So with the music in front of us, where do we start? And the obvious answer is with the chorale. These works are chorale preludes. They're intended to introduce, amongst other things, to introduce the hymn tune to the congregation that's about to sing it. And so they both tell the congregation what the tune is and also gives a bit of extra information, a bit of the feeling of it, a sense of the way that the hymn operates. And these hymn tunes, remember, were completely familiar to people. They're not an abstract, foreign thing that you've not heard before. These are tunes that people heard every week, that they lived with, that they knew from childhood. So, the hymn tune itself is very, very important as a part of the piece. In particular, this particular one which we're looking at today, Vater Unser, um, is the musical setting of the Lord's Prayer in its metrical form by Luther. It was sung perhaps more often than most of the chorales, and it has been a common feature of composers through the ages. So many of the great organ composers have made chorale preludes and other works on this particular tune. So going back a bit, Scheidt and Scheidemann both wrote good pieces. Buxtehude wrote two, one of which is particularly familiar. Obviously I love Bach's music. No other composer, I think, 
has been so consistently great. But in this particular instance, Vater Unser, I almost would cast my vote in favour of Bach's teacher, Gail Byrne, uh, who wrote the most glorious choral prelude on this particular tune. I'll play a little bit of it, in fact. so on. It's one of those glorious pieces of 18th century music and highlights this particular tune. There's something about this melody that brings out the best in composers. And it didn't stop of course with Bach. Bach wrote several settings of it uh, both as choral preludes and in the context of cantatas and St John Passion and elsewhere. And after Bach, Mendelssohn used it as the basis for a set of variations for his sixth sonata. You know the one, perhaps. So the one thing you should do before you start to play the piece is to make sure you're familiar with that chorale. Learn it off by heart, play it a few times, um, get a feel for it, because it is the way in which the piece is put together. It's its purpose, it's raison d'etre. Which actually brings us to the next question, the way in which the piece is put together. Now just stop there for a second. I can hear you saying it. We want to learn the music. We're not interested in the background. We're not interested in how it works and why we're playing it. We just want to get on with learning the notes. And that is perfectly true. It's perfectly understandable. But there is a, an important point here which I'd like to make. And that is before you start to learn something, you need to know what it is that you're learning. It's a little bit like if you're setting off to go somewhere. You go out of the door, right? And you jump in the car and you turn the engine on and you set off going. But that's actually not the first thing you do. If you're going somewhere, you check where it is you're going. Perhaps you don't need the car. Perhaps it's only 20 yards down the road and you can walk. And in fact, do you know whether to turn left or turn right out of the door? You need to know where you're going before you set off. That actually sounds a bit like a conversation, a literal conversation, which I have with somebody from time to time, but we won't go into that. Another example, if you're going to draw something, you don't take a piece of paper and a pencil and make some lines. You start by looking at the thing you're going to draw. You look at it perhaps from different sides and you try to understand it and you think a little bit 
about how you're going to represent it on the paper. So also before we start learning a piece of music, we want to know what it is we're trying to learn. There's no point at all practicing to do something if, it, if we don't have a clear idea in our head of what it is we're trying to achieve. So we do need to know a little bit about how the thing is put together, about how we intend to play it before we start trying to play it. So how is it put together? This piece is really an archetypal Orgelbüchlein prelude, which is why we're using it for this particular purpose. The chorale is across the top, more or less undecorated. The only decoration there is, is that any time that the chorale melody leaps, then uh, Bach has filled in the intermediate notes so that everything is adjoining. The other three parts, it's in four parts throughout, share a figuration, a ta 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 dum dum figuration, which are disposed in such a way that some voice or another always is moving in a semiquaver movement. So there is a sort of perpetual motion going on, which we do need to understand and we need to appreciate in order to make the piece flow. Apart from that, really the piece is put together just as a four-part chorale where the harmonies have been spread out among the parts to maintain that constant sense of motion. And so a good approach to learning this piece is actually to do a synopsis, if you like, of the harmonies. Take it back to being a four-part chorale and learn how those harmonies progress, where the music is going at any one time. I often say to people that nine-tenths of the process of learning a piece of music you could actually do sitting at the back of a bus. And that's a bit of an exaggeration, but there is an, an element of truth in it that so much of what we do is thinking about it is working out what it is that we're trying to learn before we try to learn it and making ourselves familiar with what's happening so that it doesn't come to us as a surprise. Okay, that's more than enough talking about it. Let's get on with actually learning it. Where do we start? We have the music open in front of us. What's the first thing we do? Well, one answer is we start at the beginning and see how far we can get. And when we can't get any further, we stop and go back to the beginning and try it again and get a little bit further. And you can get that way a little bit further each time and eventually you'll get through to the end of the piece. And that is absolutely the worst thing you could possibly do. That is a recipe for disaster in learning any piece of music. Why is that such an awful idea? Well, there are a number of reasons. The one is that you are teaching yourself from the very beginning that you can't play the whole piece. You're teaching yourself, you're training yourself to think, ah, there's going to be a difficulty in a minute. I'm going to play something wrong. The second problem is that you set off at the beginning and start playing and you make a mistake, so you stop and you try it again. But you've just made that mistake and there's a fairly good chance that you'll make the same mistake again the next time. And having done that, you've learned again, you've taught yourself to make that particular mistake. You've programmed yourself to play it wrong at that point. And you will then have to unlearn that mistake which is a waste of time and it's also difficult. That mistake will always be there just lurking in the background. Another reason again is that when eventually you get all the way through the piece, you've managed to get to the end, you will have played the beginning a hundred times and more, but you'll have played the end two or three times. And so, as you're playing, 
you will always have the feeling that it's getting more and more difficult. That you're swimming from the shore out into deeper and deeper and deeper and less charted waters. You're setting yourself up to fail. So let's try something different. Try it a different way. Play the last chord. Yeah, go on. Just the very last chord. There. Now you've played all the way through to the end without making a mistake. That's a silly thing to say, perhaps, but it's true. You have. Try the pedal part for the last bar. Okay. You can do that. And add the chord at the end. Now you can do that. Try the left hand for the previous beat as well. And with the pedals. And so on. Work your way back to the previous beat. Try it with the right hand on the pedals, perhaps. And with both the hands on the pedals. And do you know that you've now played one twelfth of the whole piece without a mistake? and in a matter of a few seconds. Work your way further back. Perhaps another beat. Go back to the beginning of the pedal, the last piece of pedal line. And so on. Put it together bit by bit back to the beginning of that phrase. And once you can play that phrase, and incidentally you're now um, I think a fifth of the way through the entire piece, once you can play that phrase try it double dotted rhythms. like that, why try altering the rhythms? The reason is that you have learnt once how to play it, now you're challenging your brain to look at it in a slightly different way. You're learning it effectively a second time and your brain will be able to process more clearly, more easily what you're doing. Once you've done it a couple of times with double dotted rhythms, you can try it half speed, staccato, but keep the melody line, the chorale melody, um, legato across the top. So try it in different ways, in different formats, and then again play the whole phrase. See if you can play the phrase from memory as well, which also helps. And once you finish that phrase, do the same with the previous phrase. Learn the whole of the previous phrase working from the end of it backwards. And every now and then play all the way through to the end so that you learn the connectivity between the phrases. Doing it this way, you can learn the whole piece probably in a quarter of an hour quite easily. What are the advantages? Well, first of all, 
you're training yourself to succeed. Wherever you play, whatever you play, you can play all the way to the end without making a mistake. You are learning that this is possible. You can do this. Secondly, you are not wasting time. Keep going back to the beginning. What you're practicing is things that you can actually achieve. There's no frustration involved of making mistakes. And you're not going to learn mistakes because you're not going back to the beginning repeating what you've done and falling into the same error again a second time. You're practicing what is correct. And then again, every time you play a chord, you know where it's going to. So you're not practicing where things have come from, you're practicing where they're going to. And so you are going to play in the end with a sense of direction. And finally, to go back to that image which we referred to earlier of swimming, doing it this way, you will always feel that you're swimming towards the shore. You're swimming into water which is getting steadily shallower, calmer and more charted and more familiar. There is safety. So you will play it better and you will learn it a lot quicker if you start practicing from the end. So if there is nothing else that you take from this film today, that is the one thing which I really, really want you to take away. It will transform the way that you play and it will transform the way that you learn and how effectively you practice. So as you're going back through this piece, phrase by phrase, remember to focus on the chorale melody. We've said how important that is for the piece, it's the whole identity of the piece. Keep the chorale melody in mind. Remember it floating there across the top. And imagine that you were playing it on one of those other instruments that you've listened to. So two things to take away. The first one is when we're learning something, we can't learn it unless we know what we're trying to learn. So think about it. Imagine yourself playing the piece without the hindrance of actually having fingers and feet and instruments in the way. Imagine how you want it and then try to achieve that when you're practicing or when you're learning. So always work towards a particular goal that you have worked out in advance. And the second thing is make life easy for yourself. Be kind to yourself. Don't struggle and think if at first you don't succeed, try and try and try and try again. It's not the way. Yes, of course, we need to work at it. We need to practice. We need to spend time, but do it constructively. Don't waste time uh, practicing in a way that isn't going to be as helpful. So start from the end, play the last chord and then work at getting to it bit by bit. Yeah, I think that's probably all we need to say about this piece today. Enjoy it! <laughs>